It's almost decision time for Chairman Powell. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures just about unchanged on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, equities little changed. It's the calm before the storm. As Fed Chair Jay Powell prepares to take the spotlight, the rescue of First Republic may need government backing. We begin with the big issue, caught between high inflation and a banking crisis. We're facing a big Fed meeting. Aiming both for price stability and for financial stability. I'm anxious to see what the Fed does. Inflation is still running at, at quite elevated levels. Yes, inflation is too high. It is the inflation on the heels of many years of very low rates. They can't quite stare the inflation bear in the eyes and do nothing. The market is giving them 25 basis points. Go to 25, wait and watch what happens. What we've just seen in terms of banking system, you don't want to play around with banking crises. It certainly has given the Fed reason to pause. Taking a breather on the rate hike process is is prudent. Do they pause another question altogether? We say it every time that it's the most important Fed meeting. I think this one actually is. Until the next one and the one after that, Morgan Stanley's Jim Caron joins us right now. Gershon Distant fan of Alliance Bernstein with us too. Let's go to you first, Jim. We've got the decision, the statement, the forecast, the presser. What are you focused on today? Well, clearly it's going to be the statement, and I want to see what the what the Fed does in terms of communicating its terminal policy rate, because what we know from last time is they were talking about a 5.5% policy rate, and then ultimately, clearly what's going on with the banking crisis that's taking place right now, that rate may come down, or at least it should, and if it doesn't, that's going to be a surprise for the market. So, you know, as everybody's discussing, it's between financial stability and fighting inflation, so I think the Fed is in a very, very difficult spot, but... Ultimately, I think that they that, that they do need to focus on some in, in inflation fighting language, but I think their language is going to be very, very important. So, you know, my view is that they hike 25 basis points, but they have a very, very soft language around that that's going to be very data dependent, depending on what happens with the turmoil in the banking sector. It's almost impossible to game this out, but let's talk about the language. In the third paragraph of the statement from the last meeting, this phrase, the committee anticipates ongoing increases. Gershon, do you see reason to take that out at today's meeting? I, I think the Fed is in a, just a real big quandary here. I mean, you, ha you hit the nail on the head. We're battling, are we going into recession? Do the events of the past couple of weeks make it more likely that we are? Or is inflation going to be the main problem? You know, at first blush, you would think that, I've heard many of your guests say this morning, John, this is nothing like the global financial crisis, and it's not. The starting point is so much better for really everyone, consumers, corporations, um, and so you would think that this is just going to be a blip. Nevertheless, we have to be humble. We don't really know. And it's possible this is the start of something more sinister. And here's the problem the Fed has. The future path of monetary policy, not just today's decision, but down the road, is dependent on answering that very question. If recent events make it more likely we're heading into a recession, not only shouldn't the Fed be considering a 25 basis point hike today, they should be cutting rates. But if this is just a blip, if we just move on from this and inflation is still the main problem, they have to continue to hike rates. The problem, simply put, is that the desire for monetary and financial stability is at odds with the desire to bring down inflation. Raising rates in the face of a potential recession is a really bad idea. But so, too, is cutting them when inflation is still a persistent problem. The Fed's in a real bind here. Today. So, Gershon, we'll make it even harder for them, shall we? They've got to make forecasts today. Now, I think it's impossible to make that forecast on where you think things are going to be a week from now, a month from now, a quarter by year end. But they have to do that. And that's when it comes to signaling. This is not about a forecast. This is about what you want to signal in those forecasts today, in that SCP. Gershon, where do you think they'll come down on what they want to signal today? Well, I, I couldn't agree more, John. 25 basis points is a rounding error in the real economy. 
And I'm not sure what they want to signal, to be perfectly honest. I think they ideally want to keep optionality because they just don't know what's going to happen. Monetary policy works with a lag. We know that. We only got the 3% on the Fed funds rate, hardly restrictive in October. So we're just starting to see the impact of all this liquidity coming out of the system. What's interesting to me today, John, is I'm not even sure what the market is expecting. If you told me <laughs> what the Fed's going to do, I couldn't tell you what the market's, how the market's going to react. Yep. If they raise 25 basis points, is that a signal that you know, everything's clear um, or not. If they, if they maintain rates where they are, uh, is that going to give relief to the market? Or is the market going to say, wait a second, are they serious about fighting inflation? Maybe the Fed knows something we don't. So I'm not even sure what the market really wants to hear today. But the important thing for the Fed is to keep all options on the table. They have to look at the data that's going to come in over the next several months, and they're going to have to make decisions. And they just don't know today what they're going to do in the future. I'm not sure what the right balance is. Jim, I think I've said that repeatedly over the last couple of days. I've got no clue. Jim, to Gershon's point, there is a belief out there that the more dovish they are today, the worse it actually is. Because people sit there and think, what do they know that we don't? Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. And we can certainly try to game it out in that way. The other thing, though, too, is that we have to understand that what one of the things that created this problem wasn't that interest rates were high. It was that inflation was high and interest rates rose to respond to that. So if they don't address the inflation problem, then they don't really actually address the main problem of, of higher rates creating all of these all of these other issues. So, look, you know, I, I think we have to see this through, through the lens of financial conditions. On one sense, there's a potential tightening of lending and credit standards that's going to slow the economy. But on the other sense, what we also have to think about is that there's also an easing in interest rates. Just look at what, where two-year treasuries are. Look at where they were two weeks ago. Rates have come down a lot. People's Fed, terminal Fed funds expectations have come down anywhere from 50 to 100 basis points from where they were two weeks ago. So that's an easing in and of itself into as Gershon was discussing, into what it's potentially an inflation problem in, in, in the markets. So they are in a very, very difficult spot, but I think that they're going to rely on financial conditions and they're going to say, look, there's an easing on the rate side, there's a tightening on the credit side. What's the net effect of these two things? And two months from now, let's say we get past all of this and it's, it's an idiosyncratic event, did financial conditions actually ease into an inflationary cycle? That's going to be an issue, too. And for me, that's a really, really big risk, because then the Fed's going to have financial stability problems and an even bigger inflation problem. And it puts them in, puts them in, in an even worse spot down the road. Well, we've got some financial stability issues right now. A bit of breaking news. Let's cross over to Abby for that. Morning, Abby. Morning, John. And yes, we do have the shares of PacWest Bank Corp plunging right now, down 12 percent within the plunge uh, since the whole uh, banking crisis has emerged down about 90 percent. And the headline that we're looking at right now, there are a few of them. In fact, the first saying that it secured $1.4 billion from Atlas Financing Facility. Uh, and we also just have a headline talking about that they see 20 percent of debt deposit outflows since the start of the year. Investors not liking either of these headlines. You would think that these would comfort investors, or at least the one about securing $1.4 billion from Atlas Financing. They've also drawn down, though, more than $16 billion from the federal facilities to bolster their liquidity. So it's it's pretty clear uh, that this company is ha facing the same deposit outflow that some of these other regional banks have and that investors are feeling rattled this morning rather than uh, bolstered by the idea that they have secured more financing. Stay tuned. Again, this stock down roughly 90 percent just over the last two weeks or so, John. Down 13 percent this morning. Abby, thanks for that. Let me go through the numbers for you. PacWest deposits as of December 31st were $33.9 billion. PacWest deposits have dropped to $27.1 billion as of March 20th. They've seen 20% of deposit outflow since the start of the year. I just wonder how much of that has happened in the last few weeks alone. That's stock to 1075. We're down about 12%. Kaylee's going to join us a little bit later. Mike McKee's with us now down in Washington. Mike McKee, this is the problem the Fed's got right now. They talk about the totality of the data, and I just wonder if the totality of the data means what's happening with individual banks across this country at the moment. Well, the problem, John, is there are literally so many threads for the Fed to pull on today. Uh, they've got to decide whether to raise rates or pause. Uh, what's their statement guidance going to be? The economic forecast, you talked about that, the dot plot. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about whether there need to be regulatory changes and what kind of rescues the Fed might participate in. So uh, what do they focus on? And as Gershon said, what does the market care about? Uh, one thing we figure is going to change is the Fed's promise for on 
ongoing increases in the target range to be appropriate. I suspect they take that out now as a matter of uh, economic prudence and say something that would essentially mean they are data dependent meeting by meeting. Here's the economic outlook forecasts where they were in December, the last time they made projections, and where the numbers are now. As you can see, they don't match up at all. So the Fed is obviously going to have to do something there. I note in that first box on the right-hand side that 2.7 percent was the fourth quarter GDP. The 3.2 percent is where Atlanta Fed says we are right now for the first quarter. So are they really slowing down growth or do, do they need banks to cut back on lending? That'll be part of the questions for today. And then the big one, the dot plot, uh, we saw in the December dot plot that not only was the median for 5.1 percent, but there were seven dots above that. And it wouldn't take much, especially since one of the dots, Lael Brainerd, has gone away, to move that up. But then how high? And does that signal anything? It's been sort of a mistaken impression on Wall Street that this is a Fed signal. These are 19, 18 different people who are giving us their idea of where they think monetary policy should be. So we could really come up with anything. I don't think you can take the dot plot as a signal of Fed thinking, but it will influence what people are thinking on Wall Street. Hey, Mike, thanks for that. Mike McKee there. Jim Kerr and Gershon Distefan with us as well. We'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Allow me just to return back to that PacWest story. It said it secured $1.4 billion in cash from a financing facility from Atlas Partners. This after clients drew down an additional 20% of the bank's deposits. The firm is abandoning a separate push to raise capital as well. I'm sure that you know already. This stock's down about 11%. We've got some clarity on what's been happening with deposits there, and they've been getting drained in a big way. 1085, we're down about 11%. Coming up a little bit later on the Fed show, allow me to go through the lineup for you because we have a stacked lineup a little bit later. You're going to catch up with the former vice chair, Richard Clarida, Priya Misra TD, Diane Swan, KPMG, and the former Fed president over in New York, Bill Dudley, now, of course, of Bloomberg Opinion. Looking forward to that conversation coming up a little bit later. Let's check out the price action for you just briefly in the broader equity market on the S&P 500 right now, just about unchanged on equity futures at the moment. Equity futures not doing much at all on the Nasdaq either. All unchanged at the moment on the Nasdaq, on the S&P, on a Russell as well. In the bond market, Treasury yields just a little bit higher at six basis points on a two-year to four. 22. Coming up on this program, Chairman Powell on deck as the banking crisis unfolds. Two weeks ago, again, we were doubting whether the laws of finance had been repealed, i.e., was all this tightening in the pipeline seemingly having no effect whatsoever. And now here we are. There is likely to be more of the onion to be unpeeled. And that conversation up next. Intervention was necessary to protect the broader U.S. banking system. And similar actions could be warranted if smaller institutions suffered deposit runs that posed the risk of contagion. We will need to re examine our current regulatory and supervisory regimes and consider whether they are appropriate for the risk that banks face today. Let's see Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Got some breaking news just moments ago. Let's bring in the team. Kelly Lyons down in Washington, your team coverage, joined by Shanali Basak here in New York City. Shanali, what have we got? Listen, this extension of a lifeline to PacWest is pretty remarkable after they're announcing about a 20% deposit outflow. This, John, is the first sign of how much pain the regionals are feeling outside of First Republic. And remember, even at First Republic, we don't know what that deposit pressure even looks like. The more remarkable thing is that Atlas SP is one of the entities extending the lifeline here. Atlas SP was formed by Apollo out of a business carved out of Credit Suisse. Now, remember, this is an entity formed in early February. It's the speed of private capital. It's an interesting thing, John, because remember, once the FDIC gets involved in these situations, they have not really been welcoming to the private credit markets, private capital, to let these firms extend lifelines like this. So this is preemptive. Certainly, we have not hit the point where the FDIC involvement was really needed in, in scale for PacWest. But this $1.4 billion might be a template of more types of deals we might see 
ahead of more firms like this hitting trouble. I took a look at Western Alliance's ticker to see if they had announced anything this morning as well. There's nothing under their radar yet, but they're another one that a lot of these companies are really taking a look at given the pressure on the stock and uncertainties about those deposit outflows. Janani, thank you for that. For anyone confused, just a bit of clarity. It says PacWest Telecom on the screen. It is PacWest. Don't worry. The stock is down by that much. We're down about 11.8%. That's just an error that we need to fix at some point. Kelly Lyons, First Republic in focus for all of us over the last couple of days. What's the latest there? Well, we have reporting here at Bloomberg that indicates the government may have to step in in order to facilitate any kind of further rescue. Because remember, the $30 billion in deposits that 11 larger banks put in to First Republic last week did not have the desired effect. Our understanding over the last several days has been that J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon is trying to facilitate a, a deal that would see some or all of that $30 billion converted into a capital infusion. Yet it does seem like maybe the government is going to have to accelerate that process because, again, they are trying to stop another bank failure from happening. Our reporting from our wonderful colleagues here uh, at Bloomberg indicates that there are a few different options they are considering to orchestrating that deal, including potentially the government taking out um, some of the more problematic areas of First Republic's balance sheet because those unrealized losses have been, uh, at, we understand, a sticking point for investors. There's also uh, other potential options, including offering liability protection, applying capital rules more flexibly, easing limits on ownership, uh, ownership stakes. All of that said, at this point, this is just talks. Our reporting indicates a lot still remains unresolved here, and yet you still are seeing continued pressure on the stock uh, in pre-market trading. It's down about 2% at the moment, John. This and PacWest as well, these regional banks remain in focus here in Washington and elsewhere. Hey, Kelly, thank you for that. Kelly Lyons, Shanali Bassa, great job as always. Stay close. Not much drama in the equity market, I've got to admit, about 10 minutes away from the up and bow, call it 12. Equity futures totally unchanged. Back with us, Jim Karen, Gershon Distenfeld. Gents, you know how this works. A lot of people have made it simple over the last couple of weeks. Jim, it goes something like this. The banking issues lead to credit stress. You have to bring forward the recession, downgrade credit. BlackRock did just that, downgraded credit. They said this would dent confidence, it would hurt growth. Do you agree? I, I do agree with that. And I think what we have to really distinguish is, is this a systemic event or is it a heavy blow to confidence? I think it's a heavy blow to confidence. Is it a credit crunch like in 2008 or is it a credit tightening? I think it's a credit tightening. So ultimately, whatever you thought the recession risks were two weeks ago, it has to be higher today. Whatever you thought inflation might have and, you know, going forward, it's probably also lower because you're going to have slower growth going forward. So it's really a, it's really a trade off in terms of all of the tightening that we may see. And it's very, very likely to see in the banking sector and from the banking sector. When does that start to show up in the economy? Is it in the third quarter? Is it in the fourth quarter? Is it right away? It, usually these things work with a bit of a lag. And I think that that lagged effect is really what's creating the uncertainty. So look, I mean, most people don't accept, expect that we're going to grow more than 1% this year anyways. So if we're going to shave off a half a percent or more, that actually, um, that's actually a meaningful amount, meaning shave off a half a percent given the tightening of, of credit standards. That, you know, that creates more of a negative outlook for, for, for 2023, and it's something that we need to be concerned about. Gershon, bottom line, your words, I prefer high-yield credit to equity risk at these valuations. Why is that? I think very simply, I've heard for decades now about how equities don't have any duration risk, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Equities are perpetual. You have to discount all future cash flows at some long rate. So if I use the 30-year Treasury as a proxy for, for, uh, for the long-term risk-free rate, we've gone from about 1.7% at the end of 2021 to about 3.7% today. If I would create a perpetual Treasury bond, and you can do that, John, you might learn something today on, on, on the Bloomberg terminal, PRPL. Thanks for you create that. A perpetual, you're welcome. A perpetual bond, uh, and you price it, you would see that bond would be down about 35% over that period, and equities are down less than 15%, right? Just like everything else, when high yield yields go up uh, the same amount as treasury yields, we don't say the prices are down, we don't say it's really sold off. Uh, we say that it performed in line. Equities have way outperformed here. Like, in, in fixed income parlay to the tune of like 2,000 basis points. And that just means they haven't adjusted enough. I, I'm not an equity expert. I'm not predicting that you're going to have some type of crash or something. What I am saying is that high yield spreads above average are more attractive than equity levels that really haven't adjusted to the fact that the risk-free long-term rate has changed meaningfully. So let's talk about credit in absolute terms. 
we talk often about credit relative to what's happening with the risk-free rate and where spreads are. Gershon, what's happened in absolute terms over the last couple of weeks as this played out? Well, there's no, there's no doubt that fundamentals are deteriorating here, John. We expect leverage to go up. We expect free cash flow to go down. Obviously, the cost of borrowing is going up. And that's all, on a relative basis, not great. But the starting point really matters. You look at those metrics I just mentioned, they're still going to be about, even if, if they deteriorate, about 10 to 20 percent better than they normally are heading into a recession. Uh, sorry, than, than average. They're usually about 30 percent worse than average heading into a recession. So starting point matters. I think that means that defaults and losses are going to be more constrained than in previous cycles. Is high yield screamingly cheap at 500 plus basis points? No, I don't think so. But do I see a looming crisis? I don't I don't see that either. Jim Karen, final word. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I don't disagree too much from that. I think high yield around 9%, investment grade credit around 5.5%. Default risks are likely to go up with a slower economy, but I don't think it's going to be you know, excessive. So I think these yields give you some protection. The other thing I'll say in equities is that you know we, we would expect earnings to come down. We would expect profit margins to come down. But I, I also think that there are some opportunities for, for companies with good balance sheets and, and, and decent liquidity that actually you can go shopping on sale a little bit here. You have to be very selective and it's very sector specific. I would argue more the materials and industrials uh, sectors of the market, maybe some consumer staples. So again, somewhat defensive on the equity posture, but I do think that there are some things, some bargains out there too. Hey Jim, Gershon's assigning homework for the commercial break now. Going to work the Bloomberg terminal over the next couple of minutes. Jim Karen, Gershon Distenfeld, to the both of you, thank you as always. Equity futures right now, positive, about a tenth of 1%, not even that, about seven minutes away from the opening bell. Coming up the morning calls and later, looking for cover. Why Nuveen Sarah Malik is positioning for recession, that conversation around the opening bell, plus pushing ahead to Chair Powell's news conference with Deutsche Bank's Matt Lazzetti. All of that coming up in about seven minutes' time. about 20 seconds away from the opening bow, going into the hardest decision for Chairman Powell in this whole hiking cycle. Equity futures right now unchanged on the S&P on the Nasdaq positive by about a tenth of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. Last week, the Nasdaq absolutely flying. And since this mess started, the S&P 500 is now higher over that period, believe it or not. There's the opening bow, switch at the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this on a 10-year, unchanged at 361. Unchanged does not describe the moves we've seen over the last couple of weeks in the bond market, the 10-year at 360-ish, the two-year right now at 422, up five basis points on a session, a bit more curve inversion, back to about negative 60. Bear in mind it was at negative 110 or something like that just a couple of weeks ago. The broader market looks like this at the moment, about 20 seconds into the session. We are unchanged on the S&P. We are unchanged on the Nasdaq 2. We are flat across the board going into this Fed call. One stock to watch is Nike, reporting better than expected results, but delivering a disappointing outlook on margins. The company blaming it on, quote, higher markdowns, increased product input costs, elevated freight and logistic expenses. Abby, that doesn't look good. No, it really does not look good at all. A bit of a mixed uh, quarter for them, for sure. Now, starting off with the positive, to be fair, they did beat sales and profits in a big way. Sales, they put up more than $12 billion in sales. Uh, that was roughly an 8% beat, and they also beat adjusted earnings by 45%. A lot of it, though, having to do with the markdowns that they had uh, for inventory. They blew out a lot of the glut that they've had there, like so many other retailers. Uh, they also uh, had talked about the fact that the margins uh, in terms of the miss and that outlook being l lackluster has everything to do with continued high freight and material costs uh, weighing. Now, this is a look at the margin picture. You can clearly see you don't have to be able to read a chart to know this one's going in the wrong direction. Over the last two years, they've lost about 6%, 600 basis points of operating uh, profit and margin there. Not great for investors, not liking it. It's expected to continue in this negative trend. That said, John, this this is not the greatest block to be on this year, and Nike, even with today's decline, is the best house on a bad block. Nike this year up about 7% almost. Under Armour down 13%. Lululemon down 5%. So again, clearly these athletic wear, leisure stories, companies having a hard time uh, figuring it out. Nike having a little bit of a tough day. Let's see how the day goes. Again, outperforming on the year. Not too bad. We're down about 1% in early training. Abby, thanks for that. Here's a view from the south side. Constructive view from one analyst. This from Barclays. Upgrade 
spreading the stock to overweight, seeing the potential for 20% upside. The analyst writing this, Nike's significant beat on sales and EPS is evidence of broad-based brand strength. In spite of a weakening consumer macro backdrop, Nike is the most attractive China recovery play in our sector and an attractive option for those seeking exposure to China's reopening. I have to say, I haven't heard China in reopening at all, really, over the last couple of weeks or so. That's Nike. Let's stick with earnings. Shares of GameStop are soaring after reporting a surprise profit for the first time in two years. The CEO saying this, we're a much healthier business today than we were at the start of 2021. We have a path to full year profitability. Kelly Greifard, this stock's flying. Absolutely soaring this morning, John, up about 46% at the moment. If this holds, it would be the biggest game for GameStop in about two years or so. And like you said, that comes after it beat expectations on revenue and actually posted a surprise profit. Let's get into the numbers. You had net income come in at about $47 million in the fiscal fourth quarter. That is GameStop's first profit in two years, John, and it compares to a loss of $133 million just a year earlier. Now, one of the bright spots in last night its numbers was GameStop's physical collectibles business. Sales rose about 12% in that category, and GameStop says it's a long-term priority. And today's 45% gain or so, it's just building upon what's been a wild ride over the past two years. Of course, GameStop being one of the original meme stocks, uh, its shares are higher by over 400% since the start of 2021, with some enormous drops along the way, as you can see. But unlike some of its meme peers, if you want to call them that, GameStop has a real business, and we got a reminder of that yesterday. Without a doubt, in those numbers, there are reasons to like that name. That stock is absolutely flying. Katie, thanks for that. We'll stay on top of that for you all day on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Finally, of course, the focus over the last couple of weeks on the banks. First Republic, the financials coming off their first two-day winning streak since February. Kelly Lyons has more. Hey, Kelly. Well, John, it looks like the winning streak may be snapped today because right now regional banks as a whole are down about 1%, and one of the biggest drags being created is PacWest. Of course, we're having a little difficulty technically this morning showing the move uh, on our boards here, but it is down, according to the pricing on the Bloomberg Terminal, by about 9% right now. We finally have some figures around the outflows. That bank has seen 20% uh, of outflows. They had 40, $34 billion of deposits as of December 31st. As of March 20th, that had dropped to $27 billion, which is why they tapped Atlas for $1.4 billion in cash and had to tap some of the facilities from the Fed and federal home loan bank system as well. Then there's First Republic, which where we are focused on is rescue talks between Wall Street leaders and government officials trying to see if an intervention can be staged to avoid another bank failure. And we understand there's a variety of measures being floated to make First Republic more attractive to potential investors or a buyer because they are trying to stop the bleeding here. This is a stock that has lost about 90 percent of its value over the course of the last 13 days. So we continue to keep an eye on that and really just regional banks as a whole, John, because as evidenced by PacWest, the concern about deposit flight from these mid-sized lenders into the uh, bigger banks deemed too big to fail remains a concern, hence the underperformance we have seen from regional bank stocks relative to the broader financials compl hey, complex, John. Thanks for that. I had a feeling you were winded down. Don't worry. Kelly Lines down in Washington. <laughs> Kelly, thank you. About five or six minutes into the session, we are down by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down a little more than a tenth of 1%. That's the broader equity market story. Here's Sarah Maddox's take over at Nuveen. Investors should flock to safety in dividend stocks and quality growth stocks as yields decline and fears of a recession accelerate due to tighter lending standards. Focus on quality at attractive valuations. Sarah, I'm pleased to say, joins us now. Now, Sarah, I want to start, if we can, with a quote from Sharon Bell at Goldman Sachs, and I'd love your response to this. Sharon said this about banks in Europe, and they're overweight banks. They said this, valuation for banks in absolute terms has never been cheaper outside the GFC and European sovereign crisis. And even at these points, it wasn't much lower than today. Sarah, do you like the banks? When you talk about recession being pulled forward, are the banks part of the story for you? We've not been fans of the banks for a while now because of the impact of higher interest rates on net interest margins. But I do think we need to separate separate Europe versus the U.S. at this point. In Europe, the average deposit account was on average lower, and also about over 80 percent of deposits are insured in Europe. So it's in a much better situation, especially with Credit Suisse and UBS coming to a resolution. So higher quality banks, just ING in Europe, I think are in good shape. Now, in the U.S., we know the SMID cap situation is still very fluid. 
I see going forward, though, more competition for deposits, more regulations. I think that's going to be a challenge for the banks beyond the margin issues. So I think in, in the U.S., you know, you need to say um, pretty cautious. And the real key issue is we're going to experience a tightening cycle, a credit tightening cycle, because of everything that's gone on. And that's why we're more worried about a recession now, because that's going to impact the consumer going forward. So when you say quality, is the Nasdaq quality? I think there's technology. I think there are quality stocks in the Nasdaq. Technology stocks are uh, generally higher quality, depending where you look. Software companies they have strong backlogs, more uh, visible revenues going forward. That's what you want to see when you're going into a recession. Semiconductor stocks, where the cycle is likely inflecting, um, fundamentals are getting better there. Those are areas that are strong in technology. Be careful of cyclical technology. Some of these mega cap companies with large advertising businesses, those are going to be very cyclical during a recession. So you need to be selective in technology. We've been talking about leadership and a change in leadership for the best part of 12 months now. Let's call it 18 months. Just two weeks ago, then we have to frame, Sarah, how quickly this story has moved. Just two weeks ago, people were telling us that there was a secular component to the inflation story. Leadership was going to change. It was higher for longer, the end of tech dominance. Two weeks later, we've got low rates and the Nasdaq is winning again. What is the backdrop we need to think about leadership around? I think the backdrop is more around lower is over. I do agree that it's going to be tough to get inflation back to that 2% target level. So I don't think it's about growth versus value or value versus growth for going forward. I think you can find uh, attractive stocks in both areas because we probably do have sustainably higher inflation uh, going forward even as we get through a recession. And interest rates aren't going back to the levels that we saw post the GFC. Pre-GFC for about 50 years, and uh, the average Fed fund rate was almost 6%. Post-GFC, it was under 1%. We're going back to something that's more normal, and that can be good for growth or value stocks, which is why you need to be selective across the board. Sarah, we've got to talk about the Fed as well, Sarah, because seriously, looking ahead to this news conference, there is a takeaway that the more dovish they are, the more worried we should be. Do you see it that way a little bit later? Well, the Fed's going to be dealing with the trifecta of looking for, to create financial stability, persistent inflation, and also the path of interest rate hikes going forward. Uh, we're looking for 25 basis points and more cautious language around ongoing increases. It's been just a little over a year since we saw that first rate hike. We're just seeing some of the repercussions of that come to life. The Fed's going to have to balance can, it's creating that financial stability as well as battling inflation. I think that's going to be challenging, and that's why we're worried about the credit cycle going forward and potentially a recession coming. Sarah, are you working on the assumption that the dot plot remains unchanged, 5.1%, the median dot for 23? I think that's going to be a key focus for the Fed. Um, you know, I think it, it'll be very close to unchanged. Our assumption right now is that we're not going to see a big move there, and the language around how they're going to think about increases going forward is going to be very important. I do agree with you that if they pause, that could be taken as a negative, that they're overly concerned. And also, if they pause, it doesn't mean that they're going to pause forever. I don't see that as a pivot. I think they could pause. If they do do that, they could still continue to rate hikes going to hike interest rates going forward if inflation persists. It's going to be fascinating to see how they navigate this mess a little bit later. Sarah, you're one of the best. Thanks for being with us. Sarah Malik there. Thanks for having Nuveen. me. Thank you. About 10 minutes into the session, we're down about a tenth on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're down about a tenth of 1% also. Coming up on this program, counting down to a Fed decision. The Fed will go 25. It's all in the messaging. And as we've seen, sometimes the messaging can be really complicated. Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank, up next. The Fed will go 25. It's all in the messaging. And as we've seen, sometimes the messaging can be really complicated. Um, I would look to Christine Lagarde and I'd look to the inflation number in uh, the UK this morning as to signals of why we're going to do 25 today. Investors awaiting the latest Fed decision and Chairman Powell news conference. This as UK inflation comes in hot with the BOE gearing up for a rate call of its own tomorrow. The team coverage starts right now with Guy Johnson in London, Mike McKee down in DC. Guy Johnson, just when maybe we thought Governor Bailey might pause himself, that CPI print yep. this morning, does that mean go, go, go? I think it probably means 25, John. Uh, we've had three softer prints 
we now see UK inflation re-accelerating, as we've just been hearing. Other central banks are going to be paying attention to that. Headline goes to 10.4 from 10.1 in January. Core 6.2 from 5.8 in January. Services core 6.7 from 6% in January. We are seeing a significant re-acceleration, John. Uh, you've got a tight labour market. You've got fiscal policy uh, that is easing. So I think 25 increasingly looks like it is the balance of probability. I think the real question, John, is what does the vote count look like? Very, very true. That's going to be interesting later too. We've hardly talked about that, the prospect of maybe someone dissenting at the Federal Reserve. Mike, just looking at what Guy described, the experience of the Bank of England, there's a playbook there. The experience of the ECB in the last week, there's a playbook there. A lot of people have mentioned that, Mike, just the similarities of the experience the Federal Reserve right now currently is going through. Do you think there's more similarities than meet the eye? No, I don't think so this time, John, because we have the banking situation layered on top for us. We have 4,800 banks in the U.S. It's a very uh, unstructured system compared to what you see in Europe. And so uh, the Fed has to keep an eye on what's going on with that. They would probably love the certainty with which the BOE is being uh, forecast now uh, that they've got to do 25. Because you look there, you've got people across the board. Nomura calling for a cut. Uh, no change from some of the big names like Goldman, NetWest, and Wells Fargo. Most uh, economists at this point looking for a 25 basis point move. The futures market pricing in about only an 80 percent chance of a 25 basis point move. So not a lot of firm convictions there. And of course, what's really going to be interesting down the road, uh, which we'll get later today when we get that dot plot, is what's the terminal rate going to be? Throughout all of this last two weeks, we've seen that come down significantly to about 5 percent next month. Does that go up with a dot plot that maybe moves it up? Or do the markets still think the Fed is going to be constrained in how far it can go by what's happening with banking? Uh, I think the statement somebody made earlier on this show that uh, we don't know what Wall Street is going to react to <laughs> is probably just as valid as we don't know what the Fed is going to do. That was Gershon Distenfeld, and that's what the Fed's got to grapple with as well. Mike, looking forward to you leading the coverage a little bit later this afternoon. Guy Johnson coming up with Alex Steele in about 13 minutes now to pick up coverage after this show. Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank says this. We expect the Fed to deliver a 25 basis point rate hike at today's meeting. However, the outcome of the meeting will depend on headlines and events which could either reinforce or upend the relative sense of stability that has emerged. Matt, I'm pleased to say, joins us now. So, Matt, we've got to work through a statement, the language of the news conference, the projections. Let me start with this. Let's go to Q&A. Let's say Chairman Powell has asked this question. And welcome to the show, by the way. Are the banking difficulties of the last few weeks disinflationary? If he's asked that, how do you think he answers it? Sure. I, I think, you know, at this point, he's, he's likely to leave it open. Uh, we're in the midst of figuring out how widespread some of the stress is, how much of a financial condition tightening we're going to get, uh, how much of a credit uh, tightening that we're likely to see from the bank lending channel. You know, ultimately, we do think that it is going to be disinflationary. We think it adds to recession risks uh, and adds to our conviction that a recession is the baseline by the end of this year. But I think from the Fed's perspective, it, it might be too early to make that call. Uh, and in particular, given the inflation data that we've seen coming in, uh, since the last FOMC meeting, that data, which you know, uh, caused Chair Powell to to begin to upgrade the, the possibility of a 50 basis point hike before all this turmoil came about. So I think it's too early for them to, to conclude decisively in either direction. So, Matt, they've got to put some language in a statement. It's got to read something. In the third paragraph currently, there's that line, the committee anticipates ongoing increases. You're looking for 25 today. Does that line get dropped? I think it does. I think you know, even if we weren't going through this, I think the Fed had an inclination to drop that language as we were getting further along in, in the tightening cycle. Uh, they had language in 2006 that I think gives you a pretty good blueprint. It, it leaves it far more open-ended. It suggests that there is a tightening bias, but that's heavily reliant uh, on the incoming data flow, both inflation, labor market, what they see from the banking sector. Um, so I, I do think it gets dropped and they, they move to a much more data-dependent uh, language. They scrapped the SCP in the pandemic. Do you think they need to scrap it today? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. You know, um, it is highly uncertain uh, what the environment is, what the forecast is at this point. It's not a great time to have to forecast, uh, no doubt. But I actually think the SCP serves a purpose here. They can move to a data-dependent mode. They can drop their forward guidance language. But the SCP should continue to show some uplift in, in the dot plot and expectation for rate hikes. And so it should reaffirm a tightening bias, even if that uh, there's a lot more uncertainty about the, the timing and extent of future rate hikes. The best guess, because this is difficult, and it's not necessarily about where you think rates are going to be year-end, it's where 
they are trying to signal rates will be year-end, and there's an important difference there. The median dot for 23, Matt, as you know, is 5.1 per cent. For 24, it's 4.1. The long-term dot is a little bit lower than that as well. Matt, where do you see those numbers coming out? We expect them to be mostly unchanged. Um, we expect a 5.1 percent terminal rate for, for this year. Uh, you only need two or three dots to move higher to, to, to move that higher. So the bar for it to, to rise is somewhat low. But I don't think the Fed is necessarily inclined at, the, at this moment, with all the uncertainty, to send a materially more hawkish message than what the, the market is anticipating at this point. One question I think would be good for Chair Powell today is we know in December no official expected a rate cut this year. I'd be interested to know if that is still the case from the, from the Fed's perspective, if no official expects to cut rates this year, even if we do see that 5.1% that dot for 2023. Now let's just stick on the presser and the questions he might be asked. I just wonder if he used the same language as President Lagarde, Matt, how surprised you might be by that. President Lagarde this morning, we will not entertain trade-offs on our primary objective. There is no trade-off between price and financial stability. Are you expecting the chairman to adopt some of that language in any way, shape or form? Yeah, you know, I, I think th there's no doubt you want to disentangle the two to the best that you, extent that you can. Um, you have liquidity issues, you have financial stability considerations. The Fed has some tools to deal with those. They have their policy rate and monetary policy to deal with their dual mandate objectives. So I, you know, I would expect that you do hear some of that language. But I think the reality is, you know, if you have financial stability risks, considerations, credit condi conditions tightening, that spills over into how you should think about the dual mandate objectives. It spills over into how we should think about growth, the labor market, and inflation, and, and we think adds to recession risk. So to the best that you know, we try to disentangle the two, they're not mutually exclusive. And to the extent that we get financial condition tightening and financial stability risk, I do think it impacts monetary policy and their dual mandate objective. Matt, I've got to ask this then, because some people think if they don't hike today, if they're super dovish, that's a reason to be concerned. The question I've asked, Matt, is what access they have to data about the financial system that we don't have. Is there really a situation where the Fed, in this moment right now, in this news conference with this chairman, there are things that he knows that we don't? Yeah, I think oftentimes I'm skeptical of the idea that there should be this confidence signal or, or, or channel from the Fed and, the, and their decisions uh, and the idea that they have some informational advantage relative to the market. I do, however, think this is one case where they, they probably should. You know, they should have higher frequency data on what we're, they're seeing from deposit flows from the banking system, the distribution of those flows, what stresses may, may be out there still. And so from my perspective, you know, if Chair Powell raised the possibility of going 50 basis points two weeks ago, uh, and then if they were to pause today with the market pricing it with 80 percent probability, I do think that sends a negative uh, signal about what the Fed is seeing from a financial stability perspective, about imminent recession risks. And I would be concerned about the confidence effects that that has. I would certainly take a negative signal from that. Matt, just quickly, you've got 10 seconds left. What's your terminal rate right now for this Fed and how much has that changed? We're at 5.1 percent. We brought it down from 5.6 to 5.1. Wow. Uh, as you've seen, seen the banking uh, sector turmoil. And for our, from our perspective, it's all been about learning the lags of monetary policy, the fact that we are seeing likely closer to sufficiently restrictive monetary policy, and that ultimately the Fed will have to do less uh, because the banking sector and financial conditions will do more. Hey, Matt, this was great. As always, a clinic on what he's looking for from the Fed later. Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank. Equities negative by a tenth of one percent or so. Up next, your trading diary. Five minutes in. It's the kind of price action you expect going into the Federal Reserve today. Clueless as to what they want to signal, what they're going to do, the tone of this news conference, the projections, all of the above. Right now, equities down by about a tenth of one percent. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. The main event, 2 p.m. Eastern time. A Fed rate decision, Chairman Powell news conference. Plus, Secretary Yellen back on Capitol Hill at 2.30. Two more rate decisions, the BOE, the Swiss National Bank coming up tomorrow, along with new home sales and another round of jobless claims stateside. And finally, rounding out the week with durable goods and PMIs on Friday. That does it for me. I'll see you a little bit later this afternoon for our Federal Reserve coverage. Looking forward to that from New York City. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.